That just after dark. Welcome back. Unfiltered and uncensored talk for young, young alumni of historically black colleges and universities. Uh, got Katie from Coppin on, uh, my dear brother. Uh, Chad on uh, by way of, uh, is it MSU? Is it Morgan? Yes. It's Morgan. Fair Morgan. So Fair Morgan, Chad, um, stepping in for Oars and Morganite, who has class tonight. Um, Laurel, uh, by way of uh, A&T, hating on a lot of things, candy corn, um, tweets. Whole bunch fake of news, fake news, fake news, and then um, I'm not talking to Tiffany. Uh, so tonight, um, <laughs> wow. <laughs> so tonight's episode is um, is dedicated to scamming um, some of the the institutional and individual kind of mechanisms where people uh, can scam or get scammed on an HBCU campus, and this is important. Um, not just from the sense of you, you want to have, I, I guess, like a good moral foundation on a campus community or within the campus community, um, but more as like an awareness builder uh, for folks who may not know how the scams run on campus or even sometimes how institutions have to scam uh, to stay alive. And when we use the word scam, not in necessarily in a bad way, but it is, you know, for all practical purposes, a scam. So um before we get into that, do we need to have a conversation about this this Nipsey controversy, or can we just move on? <sighs> what what's the controversy? <laughs> well, Jared, the, tell the people what you did. I'm, I'm tell gonna, the people what you did. No, I'm gonna ask. I'm gonna ask y'all. Do we need to talk about this? Do I need to? Do I need to talk about it, or can we move on? Is it? Oh, is it, I is mean, it satisfied. I think you should. I think you should at least address it because. I mean, when I originally saw it, I knew what you were saying, but we know that these days people do not read for context and, you know, things get lost in translation. So, OK, I well, agree. Well, just to, just to make it clear uh, for everyone who's listening, who cares to listen, um, if they've broken their boycott of the digest um, to, to listen to this broadcast. So there was a tweet that I posted yesterday uh, that talked about, you know, Shout out to people who are celebrating Nipsey Hussle's legacy as an entrepreneur and somebody who promoted entrepreneurialism, but at the same time, basically, just just basically jettison their responsibility as consumers. Like you're bitching and moaning about spending a dollar on the digest. And so the 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 aim of it for me was not to talk about him or his you know his tragic tragic death, and not to even talk about the digest. It was more using those two things as an, as an example of the mismatch between what we say and what we do. We believe in HBCUs, but we don't attend them. We believe in buying black, but we don't do it. Um, you know, we believe in supporting one another, but then, you know, we, the first thing we do when we have a, you know, an unsatisfactory experience with a black vendor or a black business or a black person is, is blast them on Twitter. So it kind of cooled out today. Um, and I think and I'm actually grateful that it, it it spurred a conversation besides me, you know, getting dragged for filth that some people saw it for what I intended was like, how do we how do we get together to make our words match, match up with our actions? Um, and surprisingly, for as many people that criticized, you know, what they thought was an effort to get more subscribers actually did happen that way. More people actually said, you know, on IG and in the DMs like, damn, my bad. I should have subscribed earlier. I'm glad you said something. And I'm just I just regret that people looked at the name or looked at the dollar amount and thought, you know, that it was something less than what I intended. So there that is. Any other comments from the family before we move on? Hearing none, I guess y'all think I'm a scammer uh, for trying to troll uh, Nipsey. So let's um, <laughs> let's go on. So let, let's get into it like this. If if you had to pinpoint the scams that took place on your campus as individual, uh, you know, shared now, because I think that there may be an incoming freshman. There may be a, a senior who wants to, you know, play this for somebody and say, hey, beware of how this stuff goes down. Katie, we'll start with you since um copping is Scam City. Um, <laughs> and I you can, don't do that to my you can talk, um, <laughs> And you can talk about some some or one of the um, scams that, you know, took place on the West Side as you pick up whatever okay. you drop. The microphone. Um, I, now, now that you say it like that, because I was just thinking about personal scams, not um. My university scamming me. Um, I'm not convinced that Coppin really runs scams so much as it's just poor management. <laughs> and so people feel like they got that somebody got over on them. What, so what, but meaning that, what? Like bad service or, or? Or like so like they get caught in like student loan loopholes. Mm -hmm. And then so they feel like um, 
like you know how and we all know how the, the system is set up so if you don't get something in on time you might end up taking out an external loan to cover the cost of school and then come to find out your loan paperwork came through mm-hmm. so you didn't need the external loan mm-hmm. and that happened a lot at cop that happens a lot and then sometimes people end up with bills that don't make sense right like I, <laughs> like how do you get a three thousand dollar bill when you were here on somebody else's dime anyway <laughs> like it's just stuff like that that i just i've always found perplexing unless you either they lied to you or you lied to them or there was just something that you didn't somebody didn't do right it reads like, like the scam is not necessarily that the student did anything wrong and maybe the 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 personnel didn't do anything wrong they just had a mismatch on i guess matching up what what resources need to be plugged in where and when and then it becomes right. like now oh now i'm sitting here with a financial obligation when i already right. had my bill paid you know just 2 weeks ago right and then you can't go back to school next semester because you go to school twenty five hundred, and then that turns <laughs> into five thousand. You got a hold. And now you just look, and now you just going to trade school because <laughs> you damn sure ain't going back. They done roll downhill. <laughs> Laurel, you're an administrator. I'm um, sorry, it's not funny. It, it's funny because I want to because Laurel is is definitely anti scam. This is her. I, this is her baby. Um, <laughs> so why, I would presume that you would have insight on how the students try to scam the, the institution, correct? Well, yeah, like, at least for me, especially since I work with the fellowship program, Mm -hmm. and at least in terms, I mean, it's not admissions, but it's, it's kind of the same process where I'm looking at transcripts or uh, applications and things like that. So it's like you run the line of like, okay, you're, you know, a student comes to me and it's like, oh, you know, I know you require this certain GPA, but this is what I have can you round it up or can you still, you know, can you still accept my application? And that's why I kept saying people, I was like, higher ed is not for bleeding hearts and you have to be mindful. Like, yes, you know, give somebody a break if it's a break and it's not going to cost you your job Mm -hmm. um, or risk jail time. But then also just like, okay, I see what you're doing. And, you know, on a homie level, I would want to help you out. But from an admin level and thinking about student development, I can't, you know, I can't let you slide. So, like, if you had to get something in by a certain time, our deadline is our deadline. And so it's like in certain cases, if it's something outside of your control, like we had some students that were in places where they were hit by the hurricane Mm -hmm. and their school was shut down. So it's like there's nothing they could do about that. But it's like if our application was open for three and a half months and you just now and you and you started <laughs> and you started your application that first month and didn't come back to it until right. the day before the deadline right i'm sorry i love you i promise i do but i can't i can't make an exception for you because then if i do it for you then i have to do it for everyone else and then if i'm doing that why even have deadlines so have you guys ever encountered when students feel like if the scam can't work or get over on somebody or they can't get the hookup that they feel like the system has failed or there's a there's a deficit in the culture. Like I'm being done wrong because I can't get an exemption. All the, like I think often. Um, <laughs> every, but, every time. Right? Because, and, it, and it's also because like you see, I think that you may see kind of what Laura was talking about that a lot of, I think a, an experience at HBCUs is like relationship building. Mm-hmm. And so the students are talking and so if you know i did something for someone you know they might say hey somebody helped me out like i remember when i was in college and i needed money you know what i mean like there were people who were ahead of me that were classes ahead of me told me like hey go talk to this person go talk to that person to try to get this money and so when it didn't happen for me i'm like you know i felt that way and so i know that still exists for me working at the school i work at now that you hear that well this school sucks because da 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 because once you do it for someone you know, that ha- that doesn't have to be the practice, but the expectation is that that's the practice because we don't understand how things are working or how things are managed. And then some people, like Katie was saying, are mismanaging things or doing things, mm-hmm. you know, the wrong way or not even mm-hmm. understanding the stipulations and protocols of what they're supposed to be doing with funds or services that they're providing. Mm-hmm. So I definitely think that that exists I, um, from students. And so this is a, and this is my the veteran in me talking, right? Mm-hmm. Um, everybody knows about the GI Bill and how that works and mm-hmm. how those funds are allocated. Um, well, there's an officer at every school 
dedicated to those students so that they can push those funds through. And so they have the ability to tell the entire school, hey, you can't kick this student out because they have money on the way. Mm-hmm. And they would try to leverage that relationship even if there was no money on the way. Wow. And it's like, hold on, hold on, hold on. If you don't pay this bill before a certain deadline, right, you have, and we can't get no money schedule. for you, right. either they're dropping your schedule or they're firing me. So what do you want? <laughs> <laughs> Which one do you think I'm going to do? Well, that's the no, thing. I can't. That's the thing Lowell talked about. Like, if it, 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 These things could jeopardize your job. Because and and Chad touched on this as well. Like you do it for one, and it gets around campus. Now that's the that's the rule. So you know, if I was talking to Tiffany, I asked her like, "Well, how do you how do you make exceptions for students who may have an extenuating circumstance, but then beware of how it can become, I guess, campus culture, administrative culture." Thanks for the question. <laughs> um, <laughs> the way that you the way that you fix it is by policy it only it only becomes a problem when there isn't policy or policy that sh- that is um explicit enough where people can just say hmm this isn't written so i can do xyz if it's written and you decide to do xyz you're out of here mm. period but if if there's a lack or it doesn't quite meet ends ends to tails or ends starts to tails whatever the <clears throat> oh, whatever God. this is why i'm not talking to you and i also think students ask because think of it they have less to risk than you do mm-hmm. exactly That's and tr- then that is true. even even with a change in policy i don't it still happens with with policy that is written and is on the website and in their student handbook that no one reads because i don't think i read it when they kept giving it to me every <laughs> a and I, I, know, I only like, read it when I thought like, I would get in I'm trouble. Like, when you thought you'd get in trouble, exactly. I didn't read it. I know they're not reading it. Right. And so it's, like, it's the type of thing where you only look at until crisis happens. Oh, it's a crisis. What am I supposed to do? Wait, mm. that don't make sense. Let me go to Miss Whatcha call him and see if she can hook me up in the 11th hour. And I also think that um, in sometimes at our institutions, there are practices that we think are policies because people have been in these positions mm-hmm. for so long they keep on doing them right and yeah. so we've been doing this the same way because i've been doing this for so long and we think and i think that even as administrators you think that these things are policies but they're practices right yep. and so they're able sometimes you're able to short shortcut and get in because we haven't even changed the system or worked with making sure that these things are covering our asses part mm-hmm. of my language no, that's uh, fine. This is after dark. I wish I could okay. tell y'all what I did today, but it's okay. No, we're not speaking to you. So we're gonna take our first quick uh our first break. Uh but when <laughs> we when we come back, I wanna delve right, a little bit more into that into the conversation about Please, how, those, worried about Jerry. how those those practices become policy because I think there are some connections between that and the whole aura around HBCU is fine HBCUs which is find a way or make one. So Dodgers after dark, we're gonna come right back. Not just after dark, and we're having a conversation about the scammers on HBCUs, uh, wrapping up a conversation about the, I guess, the dissonance between expectations from administration and students about how processes work to get things done. And when they don't make things happen for students, how the students feel like they're getting scammed. And so this is a this is a, a really dope conversation. And, and I think we left off on the point of don't you think that the students trying to ask? for exemptions or exceptions is part of the culture of HBCUs. We, Hey, we find a may find a way or we make one, or you can't, the worst thing that somebody can tell you is no. Um, so Laurel, to your point about, you know, you're, you're starting an important application the day before it's due. You haven't even realized you need an essay. You need three recommendations. You need transcripts. You need a background check or whatever you need. You need immunization forms, all kinds of stuff. And they want you to extend it for them. You can't. Isn't that part of the thing? Well, all I can do is 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 hear no. And all I can do is hear no from you and then your vice president and then the president and then the board. All they can do is tell me no. So I'll just keep going, going, going until I hear yes. I mean, that's nice in theory. Does that happen on the regular? (laughs) No, because I feel like I mean, it's one of those things where it's like closed mouths don't get fed. Mm-hmm. Right. And I've noticed a lot of students, even 
even with the email fiasco last year at Howard, um, and the student was saying, well, my mom always told me if you have an issue, go to the top, which I get it, but that does not work in every context. Right. So it's more so like it's for that, for at least for my job, it's on the student's part. It's a lack of knowledge about how to apply for things and that it's not like, OK, fill out this form and then we process it in two weeks and then you get whatever you're applying for. Like you have to it's a set timeline where you have to set a timeline from who are my re recommenders going to be? I need to follow up with them. Such and such is out of the country. Do I have a plan B person? Do I have everything I needed for my application? It's not something you can just do in 30 minutes. You actually have to take the time to do it. And so it's like, I've been on a side where I found out about something the day before it was due, but I, I took the L. And I was like, this will be available again next, next year. year. Yep. Or And things may change in, in that time year and I may do it then or I may not and move on because it's not the only opportunity out there and then also I think it's on the schools to like more schools are starting to have like fellowship advisors for that reason precisely because a lot of these students if they either don't know about these opportunities they don't know how to apply them to an application so if they even get an application in they're not good because they're just you know oh well I gotta I gotta do a personal statement let me just write something is it just looking for grammar? Is it just me or is it does it seem like the students it's not uh you know the the usual function of getting into and being enrolled in college, right? Cuz there are a lot of fail safes that you have to have in place to get your classes registered and all that and you'll get alerts and all those kind of stuff. It's students that'll try to scam the school for some bonus stuff. Yo, I I really need that book scholarship. Why why you can't help me? Um, you know, I, I really, you know, I really need that room assignment. Yeah, I know I didn't apply on time, but come on, man. I was there last year and my roommate's standing right here. Like, it's always some it, like some bonus. <laughs> stuff. Well, like, it's not well. even the basic like, yo, I, the fail safes worked. You got into class. Yeah. You got into you got you got your bill, you know, paid off or whatever you had to do to, to stay in class. It'd be some bonus stuff. Or maybe yeah. maybe I that's mean, just more. I, I only, the only thing I can think. Like the only thing I can think, uh, and I think this is a—I don't want to say this is generational, but I feel like it is. And that in the digital era, these kids are used to getting things instantaneously. Yeah. So trying to convince them that there is a process and a procedure, and it ha it takes more than one person to approve it, and that you know this letter rec has to be read, understood, vetted. You know what I mean? And that sometimes that requires a phone call, and sometimes that phone call might take four or five days. Mm -hmm. Um. It's just hard to make them under this particular generation understand that everything is an instantaneous. And but it, it takes time to peer through 500 word essays, especially if it's 500 of them. Mm -hmm. You know right. what I mean? But, but, but I also feel like sometimes those things aren't necessarily explained to them. It's assumed that they understand it. And we have to be clear that all of our students are not coming with the necessary preparation to be where they're at. Mm -hmm. um, and that that's very, uh, that's very clear in the students who I work with, like, Yes, their bill is paid for, um, and you know, but you don't know, you don't know what still what's happening on the other side. And so sometimes they're asking. I think yeah, some people are asking because they're trying to get over, but also some people are asking because to ask at home or to ask who's ever taking care of them is going to require a lot more for them because you don't know what's happening at home. Right. Some parents are abusive. Some parents are saying, "Well, this is all that I'm doing for you, and you need to take care of yourself, however you can." You know, like some people send their they take care of the academic bill, but don't um, give the money to pay for housing. They just think that it's going to happen. So I think sometimes some students, and I'm not saying this is all, but some students are put into a hard place and having to grow up very quickly. You know, I remember my experience. My mom told me after freshman year, she's not taking out a loan. So if I wanted to stay at Howard, I needed to figure out how I was going to pay for that. And so, yes, that did require for me to do, I would call it, respectfully a little bit more begging for some money because Shay was a bit scamming <laughs> I, I, I would, <laughs> you call it you call it what you call it <laughs> you know but I, I knew where I wanted to be where you um, had to be I, right and I knew where I had to be and yet you know I asked my mom a million times and she said no and so in order for me to make that happen for myself then there were a few circles around campus that I had to do and you know that some other people didn't get to, to get to get 
but I did. Um, and I had to put myself in places and, and sit at certain tables in order to make sure that I was able to stay at Howard. But see, look, look at what you just said, though, to make sure I was able to stay at Howard, not to make right. sure that I was on, in the honor society. You're not entitled to go to school full time. But that's but, especially but if look, you haven't familiarized yourself with how to do this. And I hate to say look, that that's cold, but it's true. But look at what the, like what what you have to understand is that, you know, like some somebody had asked me asked me this the other day, like, you know, do you go to college? Mm. And I honestly really couldn't tell you a very honest answer that like looked flowery, like, well, I knew that I da 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 da. No, it was what the next thing was. Right. You know what I mean? And now when I think of myself as a first generation college student who came from a single parent household, I don't necessarily think that I came with all of the education that I should have when I went to college. Right. And I still think that is until today that these students are not coming with the necessary education on what it means to be at college, to stay at college, to survive, thrive and graduate. Right. And we are admitting students to this institution knowing that they are not knowing and i'm saying that all that at, at, not just you know at multiple institutions knowing that they don't have that information knowing that we're not giving it to them so, either so the institution scamming and 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 that goes to that so we have to be mindful like when we're raising up you know increasing enrollment and raising prices that that, that there is an impact that it's going to have on students right and that and and you know parents are back home they have no idea what's happening in college they have no idea like the fact like i had to help my mom do the fafsa all throughout my four years you know my years in college bro let me tell you both of my She's, parents graduated from college both of them graduated so i'm i was very lucky and blessed that way they ain't never seen no parts of a fafsa right so like yeah, so, now intellectually they could go through obviously they could go through questions and and answer them but to to be second nature of like okay you gotta have the tax returns ready for this part you know, like you got to you, you got to be able to to, to connect the, the school number. And this is where you find the school number, the federal ID for the school. I like, didn't know where to do that. You know, like so you're talking about two educated parents that weren't even familiar with that process. So you're right. We had to work on that as a unit when I came home in the summertime. So imagine a student that their parent that doesn't have a unit zero. They don't they don't have a unit. They don't have familiarity. They don't have an uncle. They don't have a mentor that's available. I do feel for them. But where do you where do you get the concept like yo i i gotta fight through it to the point that i'm not going to try to i, I guess skip for lack of a better term scam my way scam my way through it because at some point that's going to run out and it's also not just the college you also have to think about what their education background was like before they get there people always forget about k through 12 mm -hmm. and even when i i took a Talk career counseling it. i took a career counseling course and we had sections that talked about career counseling for elementary school, mm. career counseling for middle school. And I got in, <laughs> I got in an argument because, of course, other people in my class were white people. So that was fun. But they were setting the argument that, like, it's not too early to, you know, have those conversations. And I'm like, and I'm like, you're right. Like, we had career day and, you know, we go on a field trip to like a fire station and you learn how it is to be a fire person, mm -hmm. not fireman. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but even I would have said firefighter, you know, even at that age, I didn't think about it as, you know, I want this to be my job because then you also have to think about, OK, background wise, like, you know, my parent or my guardian or whoever is looking after me, they have a job, mm -hmm. a job and a career is not the same thing or right. I'm just focused on trying to get through school. I'm not even thinking about what's after that. I'm just trying to handle today. I'm trying to handle tonight. Yeah. And so I feel like a lot of people put an unfair burden on colleges and universities to like, well, how Teach. are you going to address all these things? And I'm like, honestly, these are things that should have been addressed like years ago. Yeah, years ago. ago. Got yep. here. Yep. So even if they have like support on campus for like how to do your FAFSA, which would be hard because you kind of have to do that, especially for freshmen, you had to do that before you even get on campus. March one. But I'm like, there's only so much that there's only so much that they can do once those students get there. Yeah. So I think I mean, I don't know. I think it's like a, it's a systemic thing that I don't think colleges themselves can take on by themselves. They can help. But I also do think that, you know, regardless of circumstances, it is on the student because that is a that really is the first time where you're learning how to advocate for yourself. Mm -hmm. And if you're even if you're unfairly put in a position where like, OK, I have no money or like I did last year, but now I'm essentially getting cut off. What am I going to do? 
that's when your survival instinct should kick in. And it's like, okay, do I really want this? Yes. All right. So what do I need to do to ensure that I stay here? Past all the BS, my school doing what they do best, which is giving people the shuffle. <laughs> and how and how am I going to navigate those things? And I think students today are kind of like, it's kind of like, oh, challenge happens. What do I do? Help me. So last week when I was at home um, recruiting, I was at my alma mater and my twin brothers currently go there. And they were like, and two of their other friends in, in their whole friend group, they were like, can you help us? I'm like, help you with what? I'm here. And so one of another, another friend of the group, she just doesn't know anything. And they're like, she don't know nothing. And she has good grades. She has good test scores, but she don't know nothing. I'm like, what does that mean? Then I found out what that meant. I'm like, so what's the problem that you want to solve? I don't know. What's something that you're passionate about? I don't know. What did you want to be when you were were younger? I don't know. I'm like, do you want to go to school? I don't know. I'm like, so I know your grades. That's I know what's what up. Grades. At least you're being honest. <laughs> yeah, and she was she was being dead ass honest. She was. I'm like, is this overwhelming for you? Like, I'm trying to really understand why is why is every answer to the question that I ask, I don't know. And it's because she's overwhelmed. I'm like, you don't know what comes after high school. She's like, no, I don't. I was like, so you you know you were supposed to do four years here, and now that you're finally almost to the end, literally have a month left, you just. You never, you never thought about this point in your life. She's like, no. It speaks to Chad and Laurel's point. Like, but those. To be honest, I didn't either. But, but that's okay. It's all right. I didn't really know what I wanted to do until I was twenty five. I'm out of school. That's 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 life. But it, it speaks to: Do you have people around you that have conversations with you that model for you the right. way that you find the path? And so, you know, I do she, have one <laughs> caveat to all of this, right? And how this generation is being raised in particular. I watched a segment on, I believe, uh, NBC or MSNBC or something like that about what they call snowplow parents, right? New, a new a new title where snowplow where parents are just doing everything they can to get rid of all of the obstacles for their child. Oh yeah. And to the point where they become adults mm. and they don't know what adversity looks like, mm, feels yeah. like, what intensity yep. is, and I think that's what Tiffany was just speaking to. Her parents probably did everything for her from changing her diapers to scheduling oh. appointments to <laughs> you know what I mean? Don't that's not your friend, oh, this is your friend. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? No, no, not your parents. No, I'm saying that child. I'm, child. I apologize. Ooh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Don't talk about Miss Rosie. I'm sorry. Not no. <laughs> and so like and so like there's a segment of society that is exactly like that where they're just the parents are getting rid of all the obstacles and so the first time they get yelled at at work they're calling their mother i, I remember you know I, what i mean i was at although the first time i got yelled at at work i did call jared and i did call my mama but <laughs> <laughs> That's back when I was I, talking to um, you, Chad. What, were you, get, Chad, what were you great saying? Don't do I don't do I was at a conference. I think it was last year, and I remember like it kind of like messed me up when they posed this question. It was like most time we think like our students ready for college, and they were like, no, it's not our students ready for college. Our college is ready. Our for college our is ready for the students. Yeah. And it kind of you know made me think about even in my daily like interactions. Like I have to think about you know I work in a building with two hundred and twenty young black males or young minority males. And sometimes have to individualize my experience and my relationship with them in order to assist and help them or find assistance in helping them get things and navigate on campus. And it's like everybody doesn't think like that. And everybody is not at our institutions for, you know, the students in mind. They're not they're there to collect a check. Um, and so I have to be cognizant that there are and aware that there are people that are not necessarily giving them what they the, right. the the bare necessity yeah. in finding ways like colleges should have finance you know finance courses where they're teaching them financial management well if they're not learning it before they get here then what are we doing while they're here so they'll be able to manage the money um you know people are like well you took out more money than you were supposed to for your loans well why wouldn't they if they're looking for a quick buck then when they see that they can take out a loan that's going to get them ten thousand dollars although they need a three they need three you know what they're gonna do with the seven the same with the same thing gonna do if they was on the plot and they gotta you know pay I mean? back you gotta pay back 30 right. <laughs> over the next 30 years um, yeah lead days to, to katie's snowplow parent point interestingly enough i want to say this is last month a parent called 
about <laughs> their child. Hold up, without because we, we got to take a break right now because I'm a little bit over time. But when we come back, uh, if I'm talking to Tiff by that point, we're gonna get into her 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 rant, and then we're gonna. This is not a rant. <laughs> and then we're gonna talk about uh, some of the some of the the student scams uh, that we've experienced. That just at the dark. We'll be right back. Not just okay. at the dark. You sure you don't say that one? They don't want to talk about scamming. We're now going to talk about freak Nick. Um, oh, hold up. <laughs> well, maybe, about, what did you say we had two segments? Maybe we'll come back to the scamming, <laughs> but we need to get this freak Nick thing out of the way. So, for, for people. Do we, though? For, <laughs> Laurel's against it. Yes. Uh, Tip yes, is mad. Laurel. I'm not talking to her, so her vote doesn't count. Um, you know what? So, he, the, the story is that freak Nick is coming back, right? So, I think it went, it went dark in 2010. Um and it's coming back. Oh, no, long for that. that. Was it long? No, 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 no. It 2002, yeah. maybe. Was it two? If they got the 2002, I'd be shocked. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, it, it, it allegedly is coming back this summer, but it's going to be a one day event with a concert at a park in Atlanta. You know um, what? That's not free, Nick. By the way. You know what? I'm gonna. That's a festival. They should call it Free Nick Festival, then, because right. that's not Free. You Nick. know what? Howard's Howard's Yard Fest hasn't been the same since it became family friendly. That will be yep. the same thing that happens with Freak Nick. This is so. so I actually wrote. Wait, wait, wait. Let's 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 start from the top though, because a lot of the youngest don't know what Freak Nick is. Well, right. It's hard to. It's hard. I'm probably the only one that's old enough to remember. It actually was going on when I was in college. Um, but it was just a. <laughs> it's exactly what it sounded like. It was a freak. It was a, it was like a concert Wait, and it was like a series nah, of right, right. Let's, parties talk, about the, let's talk about the origin then. No, nah, I don't know. <laughs> Jared, you called an audience. Uh, no, you, you, you I, put, it, a, put it like this. It was one it, of those it, it was it one of those things bit, like for, for today's youth. I would say you need to put the you need to put the CIAA and your homecoming and like the homecoming let out that's in the streets all together and that's freak nick right i mean but it started out as just a gathering of the hbcus in georgia correct so but <laughs> but, so it, but it, it evolved it evolved or devolved however you want to define it into it became a party the got involved. It, depa- it became a party for everybody so then right. hbcu students from everywhere and alumni from everywhere were coming and right. then why does mo- that sound so familiar? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Hmm. What I talking about? What are we talking about? But, oh, what but you know what? <laughs> Here's the thing. That sounds like another four letter event. Right. I, I know you're you going to rep for Jiho, and that's cool. But here's the difference. Oh. And I actually wrote a piece about this. You know what the difference is? With Jiho. Oh, please tell us. With Jiho and any Green HBC. Uh, Howard Homecoming. Any, any Homecoming. You're generally dealing with that region, right? You're generally dealing with that campus or maybe their rival campus or whoever they're playing. It's that Except city. Except for Howard Homecoming. Well, University. listen, it's that region. Freaknik was something everybody was coming to. And at the time, like, listen. Atlanta wasn't. It's like when Atlanta gets snow. They don't know what to do with it. Right. And right? it got so bad that police were clocking up black people at the Georgia border that we were locking you up or turning your car around. That's how bad free Nick. Well, see, that's, that's how, that's how but see, did it get it that? Did it really get that wild or did they, did they really overreact? Because the thing about it is I think the stuff that you see today on YouTube and you see on these videos, that's, that's terrible. We don't endorse that. Nobody, like nobody my, would say like Miami spring break. Correct. Nobody endorses sexual assault. Nobody endorses harassment. Nobody endorses any of that. Sure. But what sure. happens is, I, I get the sense that black folks are saying, no, 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 no more freak Nick. White folks don't do that for, you know, Bonnaroo and their stuff. Because white folks don't go to jail for being loud. Oh, are you sure? Preakness. Yeah. Mm-hmm. White folks don't get loud and locked up in Preakness? No. No, not you, to the extreme crazy. that we would at like <laughs> oh, say the <laughs> end of a Ravens game. No, was out of, but, no. But that's still the point. It's, no, stop. Come but on, but come think on, about it. They don't get locked up. Now, maybe there's some racial I, stuff ex- that has no. to do with it. But that's still a situation where they convene. They get out of order. Some people get locked up. Some people get punched. And there's a parable here. There's a parable here. Miami, I mean, um, bike week. Okay. Um, Because the the uh, the Harley one happens a week before the one that um 
happens on Memorial Day. Mm-hmm. There are no cops for the Harley one. As soon as Memorial Day weekend turns around, there's cops at every um corner. And that's that's what I've heard from bikers. So there He's is right. a difference. That's there a, is but, a difference. but that's a racial that's a racial thing, and we can deal with that. And but so what I why don't, are we subjecting ourselves? Why would we subject ourselves to that level of criminality on purpose? But see, here's the, the now here's the here's alcohol the, feud. But here's the way I want to address it. I wouldn't want somebody to say cancel cop and homecoming or cancel Jiho because these Negroes get out of hand or they fighting or somebody got rape that is unfortunate but i'm not sure that you cut off an economic impact event and that's what this stuff is and and we talk about freak nick you know you know all the wildness and all that and the shenanigans that was bringing money to georgia they wouldn't have let it rock that long if it wasn't hotels made money venues made money black businesses made money so you know for something that started in the 80s that rocked a long time to be something where a bunch of negroes got down there and acted like apes According to the way the police would tell it, but it's that's not about, that's not that's that's not all, all it was. It's crowd control, though. It's now since you can go to jail for more things than you could back in the eighties and nineties, right? It's all about crowd control. How do you manage a crowd? Because, like you said, it was already happening, but then, like whatever year that was, where it kind of just spilled over, and it's like, oh wait, like wow, this is a thing, and it's spilling out of its containment, so to speak. And they weren't able to control it. Let, this is Atlanta, Atlanta we're talking about. Let me so say. I, I feel like it depends on where it is, too. It, can, can Atlanta of today control no. it now? Here's the thing. Greensboro has been and is able to control Jiho. I have never, of the all the homecomings I've been to, my favorite is a t Homecoming. Because it's proximate to campus. It's on campus. I love it like that. They control it. We are everywhere in Greensboro. You can't. It's like yeah. it's like Howard. You can't. You can't drive. Like there's parties breaking out at Exxon's. Like this. <laughs> there's parties breaking out at the ABC store. But even those, like even those two locations, you can't compare them because DC is a bigger, small city. Like it's bigger than Greensboro, but it's still smaller than New York. But also, it's DC, so they have Fourth of July. Right. They're used to it. Of people. I mean, just the summer is tourist season. Actually, tourist season just started here. Right. So it's like the city by itself can handle those type of crowds. Greensboro, at least with Jiho, is grown, but it's also grown at a pace where it wasn't just like, you know, one year it was the regular amount. And then next year, it's like everybody, including people on Mars, is going to Jiho. But I guess my so, I guess my point was Greensboro has not always had a great relationship with the students of A&T and neither well, of have the police, neither have the police. But it's not something that whatever incidents may have occurred has led to them saying, cancel that, no more homecoming for you. I, I think that it, it even, we might have to understand like the political aspect of it. That mm-hmm. It looked like, you know, when you look at the history of Freaknik and when it, you know, when it was kind of cut off, like what was the political climate? Because there has to be a relationship between the establishment that's putting it together and then the establishment that's going to be protecting it. You have to look at that. And that, and that like, I remember my brother went to Freaknik a few times when he was in college. And it just seemed like this thing that I thought that I was going to experience when I went to college. Um, do I desire to go? I know it's going to be a lot different because you have to be, you know, aware of the political and social climate of America now. Look at what happened in Miami over spring break. Um, these conversations are happening around political arenas and in different political areas all over the nation. So if you have this huge mass of, you know, color people you know, come into an, an area, they're going to freak out at Freak Nick. Like, of course, they did it. The they did it for CIAA. Like people right. literally left town when CIAA would come to town. But here's where I think it's problematic. I'm not sure. I don't disagree. I don't necessarily disagree with my people on this, but I'm not sure if black folks should be saying cancel the whole thing because it's too much criminality and it's too much nonsense. I think that we can hold ourselves to a great standard. We can party and have fun and it's not a criminal event like it's not it's not a it's not an extinction level event for that city we do it all the time i mean so we do it when it's not even organized i mean go to a cop and morgan game (laughs) i mean like (laughs) just events like that when you involved brings us a different element like when you know a gz is going to pop up in a 
Gucci and like their fans are going to show up, it brings a different element that nobody wants to deal with because unfortunately they don't always bring out the best people okay. or the best or the people with the best intentions. But that, and, but that's every that's event. I'm not sure if that's just black events though. Like Ravens games, like bring yeah, out the drunks, they bring the, out the okay, racists. Okay, okay. You know what I mean? We don't really care about the white ones. No, but I, I care about it in the sense that I don't want us to police ourselves so much that we say cancel it, cancel it, don't do it anymore. Because but we, I, think, I think we replaced think it so many times that it doesn't matter. Maybe it may be. It could be that you know. And I think that's what the fault. I mean, we we just figured out we figured out smaller events that are safe for us that won't get a bunch of us in trouble at the same time it could be it could be magic city classic it could be jiho it could be florida classic hasn't replaced all that stuff it could that could be it spellhouse homecoming but i'm just saying i i think that we shouldn't be in a position of saying dead all that because we don't know how to act i don't i don't and on and and i wanted to go back to us if it if it is going to come back it should go back to the black colleges organizing it like those schools need to get together and say we're going to do this for us and y'all can come support this. Do you now, think the AUC would want to take on that responsibility? Do they want to make money? Well, <laughs> if, if, if the AUC's, if the AUC student government organization, if they all have their own independent budgets and they decide what they're going to do in an academic year, what's to stop these students from doing, doing just that? I mean, because you probably can't do that and homecoming. Well, you got to try it out first. Never uh, say never. It's right. possible. And it doesn't have to. I mean, I think we're just act like you don't know how sponsorship work. All right. At its largest, it doesn't have to be some huge thing. It could literally just be with the community they're already familiar with and that's already there and start it internally first, give it a test run, and then from there, then add on to it. But I don't think it should be done in a way where, like, hey, everyone on the internet. Everywhere <laughs> we're doing this, and this maybe day. maybe it starts with them not calling it Freakmic. Probably so, but I'm just saying. Yes. I, I think if you, if anything, if you get two bodies together, or you get bodies together and say we're going to throw a party. It would be like if if Coppin and Morgan alumni just said, "Hey, HBC weekend in Baltimore," which I want to do, by the way. But you if wanna we, try, you want to explore that, if we, we did, that. if we did that, people from Philly, people from New York, people from DC would come. I mean, that's people from Kentucky will come. I'm in there. You're not invited because we're not speaking. Um, <laughs> I am invited. <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm saying, but you you understand what I'm saying? Like people, people would come like they would they would check it out and just say, oh, this is this looks like it's a big event for HBC alumni. And even though I didn't go to Coppin and Morgan, I'm still I got people up there or I just want to check it out. And it's so it's like a family reunion. Right. I mean, even and then whatever, even the and bad whatever uncle money and the drunker cousin are invited. Like right. everybody goes. Well, I don't, know. I don't know about them. They, they're going to show up anyway because they drunk. <laughs> That's the problem. This is true. Let me tell you what's going to happen with Freak Nick. Let me tell you what my theory is on this this family friendly thing because it ain't that family friendly first and foremost. They got Adina <laughs> Howard coming. They got Luke coming. Um, <laughs> they got Bun B right. coming. This ain't family friendly, so they ain't fooling Pastor nobody. But that's, but that's okay. Pastor Troy, who I like, but and I like all of them, but you know that ain't family Bun friendly. Bun B is a college professor at uh, and I mean, hey, listen, uh, Rock is put some respect on his name. The track one on UGK's first Joan is murder. So, <laughs> one of the, you know, I don't, I don't know, I don't know if that's well. They friendly. said they're targeting the quote unquote original fans of these artists, so it will in effect be family friendly because hey, these you know what? That's so going to be forty and over, ratchet as hell. They're gonna be busting it open. They not in shape. They're gonna have lawn chairs and flasks out there. <laughs> So this Joan is not. Man. This Joan is not going to be dope. Your well, so, point. So, so, <laughs> check, out, check out this logistics. This is, ATL Greek ATL Greek picnic is the same weekend, right? So the city's Do- going to be. I'm back. sorry. What? <laughs> Greek, <laughs> the Greek Atlanta smart, Greek though. is the same weekend. And it is kind of smart though. KD oh, was yeah, because you know you can't get no real, real bus coming around for like that's all that. Yes. Okay, but that lineup, it's still, you know, That's it's still going to be the auntie friendly. uncle crowd. No right. disrespect to any uncles or uncles or aunties listening. I love uncles and aunties, but that's that's what it is. So let me take but a it, let me take a poll. Go ahead, Chad. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say, but then like what the city looks like. So you yes, it's going to be aunties and uncles over here, and then it's going to be you know the younger college folk over here who's at AGP. But then the city after those things are over, what is that going to look like? 
I think the young sorry, people. Hold on, hold on. The city of Atlanta can handle it. They hold can. on, because they just hosted the Super Bowl and they did fine. So, no, the city of Atlanta can handle the volume. The Super Bowl attracts everybody and their mother and then some more folks. So, it's not a, it's not about can they handle it. It's do they want to. Let me take a quick poll. Who who on the show right now would go would go to Freak Nick? It's a no from mm. Laurel. No from. I ain't gonna lie. I ain't gonna lie. I'm going. No, I'm going. I'm going. It's good. <laughs> I don't even know when it is. So I think it's June. First 20, of all, I think it's June twenty second. Point of like, fact: my oh, wife wants it to return it? more so than me. Wow. I I I would love to, but that's my birthday, so I'm not spending my birthday. He's not going to freak Nick for his birthday. No, no. I'm not speaking to Tiffany, but I would ask her: <clears throat> Was she planning on going? That's why you're losing your voice. That's probably you're being hateful. God don't like ugly. You're right. Um, mm-hmm. Would would you go to Would you go to Freak Nick? Um, I, I would, and I I, <laughs> I would, go to, but like with a hoop or something. Like don't because she's a hater, hater, so she wants to go there to hate, <laughs> hate, 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 hate. If I don't, if I don't know you, don't touch me. Because I've seen those videos. Don't touch me. But see, that's what that is going to be problematic because. It was problematic then, but I think that, and correct me if I'm wrong, especially the sisters, now. it is definitely problematic now. It ain't yeah. problematic now. That's a that's an ass whooping. What sexual assault? Yes, it yes. was problematic then, but I think that even some sisters thought, "Oh, you just touched my butt. Okay, get away from me." Now it's like, "Me too, dog," and you're gonna you're gonna get your brain beat in. So that the sisters ain't having it now. So if you go there thinking that that's going to be the move or that's going to be the vibe, your, you buzz, your, your buzz is going to get killed because the, the sisters that are going may be going to see the concert. They may be going to twerk and do whatever they want to do. It ain't for your nonsense, bro. So don't think that what you saw on YouTube is going down in 2019. And you know, well, that's, but that's you know what, though? It may be safer because of that. It will be safer. But I think a lot of people are going to be disappointed thinking that it is that way. They have grown up thinking, oh, this is what Freak Nick is. Hey. I saw it on YouTube. What you acting like that for? You know what, though? I'd rather them be disappointed than be caught on camera assaulting somebody. That's the other point that I want to bring up. everybody's going to be recording. So every uh, brother, you're, you're right on the point. Smart. Because what was not going down in the early 2000s was people live streaming. What was not going down is the gram. What was not going down is, is just story. Yep. I mean, stuff was still being recorded, but... It was Negroes with camcorders out there. <laughs> like they only the had. <laughs> House is not the same as oh, I'm immediately posting this to Twitter, right? To get RT. And now everybody has, everybody has the camera. It's not just the one. It's like six of y'all that rolled down in the Camry, and one of us got a camcorder. I mean, you all that are Greek can maybe take some time right now to speak on what discretion is. Ooh. And oh no, nah. let it go, Laurel. How to how to practice <laughs> you know? that in your everyday life? You know, then you know, right? I I as an individual will those, will defer to the what's going on right now. Know. Yeah, about it. We about to go to our next segment. Those are what's going on right now? <laughs> what is going on right now? <laughs> why does this come up every time? Like once an episode, this has to come up, and I just don't understand why. Because you know why? Y'all beautiful and black, but you know why? <laughs> because the Greeks, particularly the brothers. We got to be a, at a higher caliber of manhood and discretion and respect. And it's too many of us acting a fool for some reason <laughs> that that are, are giving the sisters the impression like, yo, they up to no good. They can't. The things that we say we're going to do and the things that say we're about enough of us are showing that we're not that. So the, the, the letters are getting, you know, a different a different aura around them. So I, I understand what she's well, saying. I understand. What she don't care that much. <laughs> Tiffy don't care that much. <laughs> Tiffy don't care that <laughs> much. Right. About what? Right. We the gonna, letters been having a different aura. We're gonna take our la- we're gonna take our last break. <laughs> and, that's, <laughs> and that's exactly why I'm not and that's exactly why I'm not talking to her right now. Um then, uh, oh, <laughs> so, no, we're not going to break. <laughs> we are not going to break. <laughs> we're going to break. We're when we come back, yeah, we're gonna finish up you? the scam. We're gonna finish up the scam uh conversation with some of our favorite on campus scams. Not just at the dark, we'll be right back. That is at the dark, and we're back. Um, just veered off uh, course for a little bit to talk about Freak Nick. Um, and everybody, it's a no from everybody on the show is in terms of going. Um, they don't want to be. That's not a, what came out of that. They don't want to be the 40 under crowd. Katie, you're the only one going. 
uh, who said he would go. Tiff said she would go. That was a lie. Mm-hmm. I um, said I would go to Freak Nick because the wife says she wants to go to Freak Nick. I have to take care of her. She, he ain't gonna let her go alone. Why are you being a hater? That's true. God damn. If you if your butt is a certain size, you you you're under. You got a target on your back. If you go to Freak Nick. Okay. Ew. I'm just saying. You seen the videos? Um. So let's let's get back into this the the scammer conversation. Um. There's a couple involving students that that i wanted to get into one uh this uh, this affected me personally um one of them is is there are some i guess church or religious groups on campus that in their effort to like recruit students to be a part of it they can they can be overly aggressive almost to the point of stalking i don't know if this is everywhere but it certainly was a thing at morgan for years um and I'm not even sure if I should bring up the church, if I should promote them that way. But they would they would, you know, invite you to Bible study. They would invite you to, you know, prayer service or something like that. I had experience with this. I, I went I went to Bible study one time and it was good. What? I did. I thought you were raised Baptist. See, you're veering off. It was, what? <laughs> I went you're to Bible study. Off. If you it's not just a Bible study. It, OK, so let me. Also, give background. We had that same problem on campus too. Okay, so that is yeah. on more than one campus. But what they what they did was, if you went and they got your information, like they would call you, like mm-hmm. nonstop, like yo, are you are you coming to service? Or yo, are you coming to this? Are you coming to that? And almost it's almost like this this unending pressure to be a part of the to be a part of the church or be a part of the congregation to the point that a lot of people on campus thought it was like a it was like a cult. Because for the people who did join up, you you rarely ever saw them on campus again. Like they were always like, "I got to be to church. I got to do this. I got to do that," and that's okay to you know to, to you know for your campus life to be really intertwined with your faith life. That's great. But to so the basically, point, basically, what you're saying is they were Scientologists. <laughs> you know what? Lord, <laughs> that's, it, that's it actually, exactly you know what? It actually was something like that. Knew it. I said, I'm sad to say. So like. On my, on, well, in my freshman year, there was a whole little expose in the hilltop. And I forget the name. Me and Laura were talking about this the other day, but it's something like our our mother of peace or our lady of peace, they would come to the Starbucks and it would always be two um, racially ambiguous girls who looked college age who would approach girls and ask them like, hey, do you want to come to church or... Do you want to do this, that, or other? We, oh, we have Bible study. We meet in this Starbucks. Like, we're really cool. Do you need friends? Like, things like that. And it was always weird to me because I'm listening to what you're saying. I'm reading what you have, and it doesn't feel right. Mm-hmm. And mine I was even, never mine wasn't even like that. It was like, it started like, oh, do you want to come to Bible study? We meet, da, 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 da. And then it, like, took a hard left. And was like, you know, because the apocalypse is coming and we got to be ready. And I was like, and this girl caught me when That's I was leaving work. That's some Kimmy Schmidt shit. Right. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's like, I, was already, I was already leaving work, so I already wasn't in the room. I don't, in the mood, I don't like being approached by people on the street. I ignore everyone. But then when she said that, I was like, get ready. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, like, I had to give her a fake number. And I, and then I, I think I, like, turned my back and then she was gone. It was... <laughs> So creepy. She disappeared. And I'm like, <laughs> I was just like, why couldn't I just get robbed today? I actually would have preferred that to this. But now I feel shook. But it, Jesus. <laughs> but it's also, it's like, you know, our college campuses are designed for, especially when they're open, for that type of experience mm-hmm. to happen. Very true. And it's also because, you know, when we're coming and. Speak for your college campus, sir. Happen. <laughs> Um, you, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so like, yeah, because there, you know, that's happened. You know, in my undergrad institution, I've seen it here. Um, and it's because you know a lot of people you're coming here, so it's new. So you're looking for an opportunity to increase. Like, do you go to church? Yeah, I've gone to church. Well, come on, come join us. But then you know, you think about you know the churches that you've probably gone to back home. It was really, you know, like a home church. It was a culture. It mm-hmm. was, a, you know, a, a, a warmth to it. And it's kind of difficult to find that and navigate it when you're in a new space, when you don't know that area. So 
um it sucks because you know it's people who pray even you know not even just sexually but even when it comes to our religious um you know our religious hearts people are praying on our people so let's talk about some of these other scams how do y'all feel about different groups on campus um modeling (laughs) troops uh greeks um sga you some, know, pe- some people would say that some people would say that those those can be facilitators for scams. This question sounds like a scam. <laughs> First of all, and it sounds very loaded, and I'm feeling very attacked right now. I'm not scamming because mm-hmm. I'm asking the question. I'm asking on behalf of the people. The listeners may say, "Well, SGA is a scam." You know, they they go on all these trips. They do that. The Greeks are a no. scam. They do that. No. The athletes, no. stop. They always at the same table. They jump in front of you. That's a scam. Cut it out. I'm gonna give y'all two scams from my senior year senior years at Howard. First of all, and I think I said this on part one of the hazing episode and Jared might have censored me. Cool. Uh, yeah, I'm going to censor this because it's about to be a rant. It's not a rant. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> now, I will say there are some, some instances where y'all Greeks do force um, those those who are online to do things on campus so that they can be, I guess, more involved. But the way to be involved on campus isn't to start somebody out in the SGA. It certainly isn't to whip votes Oop. and tell people. Oh, who she's, who talking <laughs> Ooh, she's talking about it. Oh, she's talking about it. A certain amount of votes so that your candidate who's online can be in the position of power in the next academic So year. are you saying that Not. the SGA Greek pipeline is a scam? Mm. It's not just SGA. It can be if, if, if you're making uh, making it a point that somebody who's online who hasn't been in SGA until they've been online, if you're making that a condition of them being a member. Because what I was speaking on was that it's in other orgs in terms of people, even before they even decide to be online and they get into e-boards of different organizations just to be just to have a position of like oh well this is on my thing to show that i have leadership qualities even though within the actual org they're not doing doing nothing Mm -hmm. and then when it's spring semester the org is basically dead and inactive because your all your leadership is currently under the foot and nothing's really being done and so the students that are members of the organization that actually wanted to do whatever the organization was about and contribute and this is even happening in the regional organizations like you know dmv aggies and things like that and so it's like you don't even get what you were trying to get out of it because somebody else is trying to further their career they build a coalition they build coalition within the coalition yeah oh my god well what let me ask you about this then so what about athletes do they use their access and their i guess their um position to to scam hell yeah (laughs) what's an example of that like being in so i was an english major so i had to endure my own personal form of hazing by having to share classes with a bunch of athletes who were just in the class because they were required to take it and it's like i'm talking grammar and composition it's not even that difficult and yet they're never there or someone's always asking to use your homework or something oh, else. the athletes were hazing you by saying, "Let me see, let me see that jump from last night." I mean, they weren't they weren't hazing me, but having to deal with them mm-hmm. in the class is is hazing because <laughs> it's just like you're you're basically like how someone's at a job to just get a check. They're just there to get so passed dramatic. through. To it's get like by. you don't you're not even getting anything out of this, and you could really use all the grammar and composition. <laughs> that you need. So dramatic. and you know the teachers kind of like you know, well, this is how it is, so I kind of have to deal with it. And so that kind of sucks, but you know. Chad, what do you think about the athletes scamming at Morgan? Because we're typically not good in, in a this lot of sports. Is- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <after that>. uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't know if I have that strong of opinion like Laurel just said. Because mm-hmm. I, I do feel like in some cases that they're being scammed. You know, like Ooh, so we're talking yeah. about. I was, I'm saying that that can be arguable when you're talking about what they have to endure to be a collegiate athlete. Mm-hmm. And that conversation has happened over the past few years, especially in higher ed, about whether they should be paid or not. You know, mm-hmm. so when you're, you know, and I, and I understand and fully get what Laurel is talking about in that sense, because some, you know, aren't, they won't work hard or they'll use what they can. And that's, you know, that culture. 
Um, but, you know, they have, you know, long nights and early mornings and traveling for games. And, you know, so in that case, it's like, you know, should they be compensated for more or are they only trying to do what's being done to them? Mm -hmm. That's a good point. That's a good point. I didn't even consider that as a potential scam, but it definitely is. Right. Let's round we out. We also didn't talk about how uh, coaches recruit <clears throat> to enable it. Students who are more athletically inclined than academically inclined, but that's, that's fine. Cool. Well, that. you got to win. I mean, I understand. I understand the point that you're making. If I was talking to you, I'm not. Um, but <laughs> I, I, point, but it is a and it is Thank an excellent so point. Much. It is an excellent point. I do agree. Let's <laughs> let's round out the conversation on this. Now, we've talked about all these forms of scams. Have we considered the way that campuses and not just HBCUs, but for the sake of this conversation, yes, HBCUs. The way that we scam the community. I mean, by the way, students take over parking. Mm -hmm. The way that we disrupt the neighborhood sometimes um, with just with our just with the the volume of our activity, not because we're being loud and 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 silly, but just the volume of people in the community. Do That's we a case by case. Do we think about? Do, but it's do a we trade off because economic impact. Like yeah, but I was gonna say, do you consider schools that are active participants in gentrification as a scam? Had people actively try to um, renovate the entire district, essentially surrounded that surrounded cop and 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 build up buildings and homes so that the neighborhood looks prettier because it looked horrible before we started investing in it. Like it, it there is a trade off there. But it's can like, I, can, I, can I ask a question? Sure. Where where I mean, to the, just, and it's only to this point. I'm not saying that it happened or it didn't. But where was copping before the 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 neighborhood went down? What work was copping? Oh, I can't hear you. He was saying, "Well, so how did the neighborhood go down to begin with? If copping has has always been the anchor institution there." Um. Well, hold on. It wasn't always the anchor institution there. It just became that. <laughs> and, so and, the mean, and the neighbor went down because Baltimore City went down. So, but that's but that's why I say that I get to the point that maybe some of our institutions and in the communities are you know scamming the community because you have to have your hand in the community. It's imperative. And so, you know, when you're talking about, um, you know, drugs, we have we have programs that, you know, deal with, you know, drugs, community health and policy programs mm -hmm. and nutritional science programs that are we giving our students um, internship opportunities and, you know, field work that can go into the community and do work in the community to be able to build it up. I think so that's what, have, if I'm not mistaken, Laura, was that what you were referring when you called GW? Say again. Is that is that what you were referring to? Like the, the the different programs and the different facilities that are that are coming into areas of Washington when you call GW. Well, I was more so speaking up to them, high key, low key, quietly but not so quietly, buying up real estate, mm -hmm. and how at least a part of the city they're in, it's already pretty pricey and was kind of already gentrified mm -hmm. by itself. But it's starting to bleed out into other areas, especially with that situation. We had with um, Howard hospital. University Hospital yeah. and trying to buy the East Campus Hospital that's in Southeast and just things like that, where even institutionally, they're not doing so great of a job at trying to diversify and actually support students. And so now on an outward facing level, I mean, outside of the hospital, which isn't, to my knowledge, isn't directly connected to the school anymore from the admin side, it's still not. There's no real integration, if that makes sense. Like, there's no, like, I could even say between being going to GW and then being at Howard, even though Howard could do more in terms of reaching out to the community, I could still say they're more in tune with it than some of the other schools in the D.C. area are. And they'll use it, you know, for, like, something in their brochure if they want to get fundraising and donors it looks good but i feel like in practice they're not really doing that great of a job at it um and so sometimes when how gets accused of supporting gentrification like it's deeper than rap like in some ways they you know they can only do so much because they have to deal with dc zoning laws and all these other things and other property that they don't technically own and are leasing out and so it's kind of it's just complicated and but i i can say that it's not the intention behind it isn't sinister. Not to mention the fact that, you know, and this is actually to your point about Howard and Katie's point about Coppin. You can you can as an institution, 
you know, have a, a manifest destiny of sorts where you say we want to do this with the community. But you're right. It is it is up to the city council. It is up to the state. If they say, OK, we're going to allow that kind of zoning to go on here. We're going to allow for that kind of business to spring up here. Because when you look at other schools like a GW or a UMBC, they allow all kinds of development around the school. They say a lot of different things can come there. But when you're in a metropolitan area or you're in an economically depressed area, they say, well, we're only going to allow but certain kind of businesses to come through. We're only going to allow for certain kinds of housing to come through. Mm -hmm. And if you want for your school to grow and develop and you want it to be an actual livable community, that can be a hindrance. So uh, it's always a challenge when you have alumni and students say, oh, you're gentrifying the neighborhood or you won't stop the gentrifying. Well, what do you want it to be like? Do you want it? Do you want it to be? ran down do you want it to be abandoned row homes is that is that your idea of a, of a livable community is that somewhere where you would invest in staying as a student or staying as a faculty member or staying to build a, a business around you can't have it both ways you can't say that economic development is gentrification so you know it, it's a lot it's a lot to unpack i mean it, and there's a lot of different layers to it um, but it is to say that there's there's a lot of scamming going on <laughs> in higher <laughs> education and around. And sometimes it's it's not um, just the outward, you know, I'm trying to get over because I'm greedy. Sometimes it's necessary for survival from individuals and institutions. So glad we were able to have uh, that conversation tonight in addition to the bonus footage on Fru uh, Freak Nick. So thank you so much, um, Laurel, uh, for hating on candy corn. We're going to work on that. If I may speak to you tomorrow, um, Chad, uh, an outstanding, stop. an outstanding debut. Um, so we hope to have you, you know, you and your insight back on. Uh, Katie, uh, stop doing dishes uh, for the time for the podcast. Thank you. That so was much. not me. Thank that so was much. Chad. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> thank you so much, and thank you guys for listening again. Uh, reminder: uh, actually, the first time, please support the HBCU Digest on Patreon. Um, if you haven't set up to subscribe. It's only one dollar a month i'm not going to criticize you uh like nipsey hustle uh if you do or you don't uh, but we hope that you will and continue to support great programming and great content um on hbcudigest.com so thank you for listening uh particularly on the serious radio uh howard university network 142 hbcu until next time uh tiff if i was talking to you are we going to do this again next week we we are thank you very much okay this has been digest after dark thanks for listening peace